Vai partir Pelé, atenção, bateu violento, gol! Gol! The home of the beautiful game. Not the birthplace of football, but where it blossomed. Football, the Brazilian way. Pelé, atenção, open on the right. The yellow and green, not just a shirt. To wear it is to be wrapped up in a dream of how the game can be played. Neymar. And he's found the net. How do they do it? I'll be asking them. Asking the best of the best. Pele and Ronaldo. Life inside that shirt. To me it was like a dream to be in the national team of Brazil. Winning World Cup finals and losing them. Disaster. Uh, if we got to a final, we'd be really happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for the rest of the world, yes, but not for us. How did it happen? How was this game, made in Britain, transformed in this tropical wonderland? From here on Ipanema Beach, to Carnival, Samba and the Amazonian rainforest. There are hundreds of reasons to love Brazil, but none quite as attractive as their country's football team and the way they play. Ronaldo. Oh, what do you say about that? Extraordinary. They've always had the players that everyone aspires to be, from Pelé to Zico, Jairzinho, um, Garincha. You can just go on and on and on. The way they played was just dazzling. This is a team from another planet. When you talk about the beautiful game, you know, as much as lots of teams may now play like Brazil, you still think about Brazil. When, when I'm watching the Albion, if we string three poetic passes together, we go, it's like watching Brazil. Really is a, a unique way of playing and, and everybody wants to play against Brazil. The hosts of this year's World Cup have played in every tournament and won it more than anyone else world's most successful football nation, Brazil, win it for the fifth time. It's not just the fact of winning five World Cups, it's the matter of winning in style. And Zico! What a cracker! My mission is to explore the origins of Brazil's beautiful game. Why do they play the way they do? And what does it take to be so successful? Is it really as simple as they've made it look? And how does it feel to win and win beautifully? Here's Romario with the first chance of the match. And he scores. It's more than just what happens on the field. This goes to the heart of what Brazil, the country, is all about. They love life, you know, which is a terrible old cliche, but they really do. Yeah. So you don't just kick the ball, you do some wonderful sort of keepy up and wham and bam. Even though we didn't create football, it looks like we did. There's a bit of archaeology here, digging into the rich pickings of the country that reinvented a sport. The style of play has something to do with the sharpness that the kid born on the wrong side of the tracks needs to get by. But there are also some uncomfortable findings along the way. And I was uh, unconscious for three, four minutes. So you were unconscious? Before? Yeah, unconscious for three, four minutes. Can it be that in this home of the beautiful game, failure is not an option? When Brazil lost 1950 World Cup, it was not seen as just a sporting disaster. It was a failure of its people. For many of us, our love affair with Brazil began 44 years ago, when in 1970, a certain Pelé rolled a certain pass to Juan Carlos Alberto. The gentle pass, the power of the finish. This was the light and shade, the slow and the quick of a new way of playing. Oh, that was delightful football. 1970 was the first World Cup to be televised in colour. We knew the names of the best players on the planet. Now they lit up before our eyes. Billy. A new standard was set, 
And that's the trouble with precedence. What comes next? How can you beat that? Oh, this is great stuff. They need to take it in turns to go an exhibition. Pelé. Spearheaded by Pelé, this was the team that defined the Brazilian way of playing. Who better to analyse Brazil than the spearhead himself? Known by just one short name, most famous in the game. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. You okay? Yeah, great, you? He was born in 1940 with a longer name, Edson Arantes de Nascimento, but he was Pele. Even in 1958, aged just 17, the youngest ever scorer in a World Cup final. He won three World Cups and scored over a thousand goals in almost as many matches for his clubs and country. When you do think of Brazil, Pele's name does come in there as well. It's just it's hard not to. He's on the front of every every package that you look at, every advertisement that they do. A great ambassador for the game, and to win the World Cup at 17 years old and be an integral part of that team, you can't fail to be impressed. He's a supreme footballer in all sense of the word, in terms of physically, technically. Pele was 5'8", but he was great in the air. Great control, speed, strength, skill, he had everything. Awareness, you know, he could play in midfield as much as he's a, he, as much as he's a goal scorer. Oh, yeah, Pele! No matter where you go, it's probably one name who would be remembered as the greatest is Edson Arantes do Nascimento. That's the one, that's Pele. You were so young in the 1958 World Cup. What was it like getting into the team, being that young and so successful? A uh, lot of time, you know, people say, oh, it was very difficult for you because you were very young. I didn't have this uh, responsibility to, to win the World Cup. To me, it was like a dream to be, to be in the, the national team of Brazil. I just want to be there. 17 years old, scored a goal in the quarterfinal three goals in the semi-final and of course that famous goal in the final that's one of the goals that that must stand out in your career oh yeah no doubt no doubt because uh, i think that time uh, in europe and even in brazil uh, I, I think it was one of the first moment that people saw the game the dribbling like this uh, for me, it was not news because I used to do this in a training, but for the, all over the world, for all of the people, for well, the first time they saw in the World Cup, no, was fantastic. Most important than that, people don't know what was Brazil, where was Brazil, but to win this World Cup, then Brazil become well known all over the world. Everybody after the final, they they start to read, you know, to understand where was Brazil. 62, you won the World Cup again, you got injured early in the tournament, and then 66, you, you were kicked out of the tournament. It was terrible what happened to you. Really was heavily brought down again there the second time, quite unnecessarily so too. Do you feel angry at that at all, looking back? Because you were at your prime then. It was very, very sad. I say, I think I'm going to stop to play football. <laughs> I that saw was, I... I said, that's, that I was so depressed. But uh, fortunately, you know, Pass. You changed your mind before the 1970 World Cups, thankfully. <laughs> Anybody of my age or older remembers 1970, the Brazil side, as, as we think the best side ever. Would you agree? I agree. I think the 58 will have uh, individual players, maybe more and better than 70. But as a, as a team, we are perfect team. There were some brilliant moments from you, you in that World Cup, but there are two moments for me that stand out where actually you didn't score. One was the long range shot against Czechoslovakia from the halfway line, which was so close, and the other one where you dummied the goalkeeper against uh, Uruguay. Oh, what? Uh, what idiot! Well, I was in China two weeks ago. They showed that beautiful moment. But the goals they didn't show. <laughs> say, listen, I scored more than 1,000 goals. You yeah. just show. I so wish that had been a goal. We've marvelled at Brazilian football uh, over the years. Mm. It's played with great style. Where do you think that culture of beautiful football comes from, Pele? I think come from the 
the barefoot, the kids who play on the beach and on the street. I think that's the reason the football is a more spectacle than, than in Europe, than in the, the rich country. He was what he was called, the king. But did we ever see him at his very, very best? There is a theory, held by Brazilian-based journalist Tim Vickery, that we didn't. The great tragedy of Pelé in the World Cup is that although he's so identified with the tournaments, the World Cup never saw the best of Pelé. The best Pelé is around the mark of 62, 63. You just watch him, it's like a force of nature. The best goal that I think he scored in the World Cup came in 1962, in the opening game against Mexico. Oh, what a great goal! What a superb goal by Pelé! And 62 could have been for Pelé what 86 was for Maradona when you're seeing a magnificent footballer right at the peak of his powers, but he got injured in the next game and he, he played no further part in the tournament. And that, I think, is, is very sad because that Pelé, the Pelé of 62, could have been the greatest thing that we ever saw in a World Cup. What the world did see was enough, enough to guarantee a life after football as a pin-up, politician, businessman, FIFA ambassador, Pelé. One short name that says everything about Brazil. But for Brazilians, Pelé is not the only one. We tend to talk of Brazil's, the great 12 years where they won three World Cups, as the Pelé years. In Brazil, they don't call them the Pelé years. They call them the Pelé and Garrincha years. Because in Brazil, Pelé and Garrincha together, that's what made Brazil great. Born in 1933, Manuel Francisco dos Santos, or simply Garincha, won two World Cups. Physically, he was no Pelé. He was anything but imposing. Garincha was born slightly deformed. He had one knock knee and one, and, and, and one bow leg. And I remember watching videos of him in 1958, and he was incredible. I mean, when you talk about what modern wingers do, because back then, Wingers, you know, you get your head down, you go to the ball and you put crosses in them. He was doing stepovers, he was doing lots of skillful things, and his change of pace, change of direction, as well as scoring goals. Garincha! It's a goal, a beautiful goal by Garincha! Garincha was uh, special because uh, he improvised a lot of games, a lot of play. He was a player who has a, a brilliant, brilliant talent, you know. Garincha from being, you know, the archetypal skillful Brazilian because Pele wasn't that. You know, Pele was he had great skills, but what we think about Brazil are real silky tricks and Pele wasn't Pele wasn't like that. I mean he was a, he was very skillful, but in terms of being very eye catching, Garincha obviously was the one and of course on the other, Maria Zagallo played on the left wing and he was just a real hard working up and down British type of a player, if you like, Zagallo. But Garincha really was the superstar. Não é bom. É bom você jogar a favor do Garrincha. He was amazing. He dribbled like you wouldn't believe. Uh, I was at the barber once and he asked me if Grinch's dribbles were true or magic tricks. He said that he looked like Charles Chaplin dancing around. I said, look, they're all true, and that was just Grinch. Grinch represented Brazil, and we symbolized Brazil slightly better than Pele did because he was the, he was the person who, who made you laugh. He had these amazing dribbles. He was the person who was playing for, for, for playing's sake. He had fun. There was the Garincha way on the field, and there was something about the way he went about living his life off the field. I think they loved more Garincha than Pelé, because in that time, Brazil was a, a country looking for his identity, and the real Brazilian was Garincha, was not Pelé. Garincha was the crazy one and disorganized and uh, Garincha is the one that two days before the final match disappeared and go to fish, I don't know, 100 kilometers from, from the hotel. The Brazilian recognized themselves in players like that in that moment. Pelé conquered the world, the king reveling in the limelight. For Garincha, it was more of a struggle. When I went back to Pau Grande, talking with one of my friends, he told me, 
Your house is full of people. And that's when I realized I was famous. But then coming home tired after training, I did find the attention a bit overwhelming. Gahincha is, I think in many ways, the, the Brazilian George Best. An unbelievably talented individualist, but someone whose career at the top level was relatively short because of, of similar demons. In 1983, at the age of 49, Garincha died, an impoverished alcoholic. His funeral procession brought the road from the Maracanã to his hometown to a standstill. It's part of us, you know, to create these fantastic and amazing players. You have Pelé, you have Garincha, and you have Zico, and you have Ronaldo, and Romario, and Neymar, and, and something that's... Um, it's difficult to understand how we produce this kind of flair, but I think it's part of our tradition, it's part of our, our mentality. It's in our blood, I know. I, I think there's something that comes from the, the childhood, you know. Every kid in Brazil wants to play soccer. No country can keep producing players to rival Pelé or Garincha, can it? Brazil, it seems, can. And there's one player I couldn't wait to meet. Hi, guys. Oh, hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Thank Welcome. You. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. You? Good. Good form? Yeah. Ronaldo played 98 times for Brazil, scoring 62 goals and winning two World Cups. Along the way, he collected a golden boot and became the highest goal scorer in World Cup history. And it's a moment of history for Ronaldo. He's now out on his own as the World Cup's all-time top goal scorer. That's the straightforward bit. As well as being brilliant, Ronaldo remains one of the enigmas of all time. There's controversy here, the 1998 final. But first, his rise to the top, from the bottom. He was born in one of the poorest parts of Rio. I presume that most Brazilian boys, yeah. when they grow up, they want to play for Brazil yeah. when they're older. We, we grow up, think about being a player, being a football player, because most of Brazil are poor, and uh, we seen at uh, football a great opportunity to, to be a, a big uh, star and so you can help your family and you can uh, buy things. Ronaldo dropped out of school when he was 11, but he was soon giving master classes to the watching world. We very much admire Brazilian style of football and people say yeah but when we when we play football there's music in the dressing room and everybody's dancing is it really like that yeah it's really it is, like yeah. Uh, yeah yeah but it's not mean that uh, is the solution yeah. to win you know you, you cannot maybe go into England team and put some Brazilian music or hip-hop music we can't and, dance yeah rubbish. <laughs> but it's not that to win I, I think it, we did that, and the guys playing now is still doing it. Just because we have fun. We are very happy people. And everything we do, we do with love, with, with our heart. Ronaldo, a talent apart, a rare genius, but also part of some greater shared experience of being Brazilian. Everyone in this land of 200 million people seems to love life out loud. One man who knows and loves Brazil is Michael Palin. The comedian, globetrotter and football fan spent five months exploring just about every corner of the country. I mean, you spent quite a lot of time in Brazil. Is it, is it a country you, you warm to? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's such an easy place to enjoy. I mean, all the sort of you know, the kind of hang-ups and restrictions and, 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 and sort of conditions of life up in the, the northern hemisphere where you've got cold weather and you've got rain and all that sort of thing. Suddenly you go to Brazil and everybody seems to be having a good time. I mean, not entirely, but it, it does feel like a country that's very, very free and open and, as I say, got this feeling of celebration. 
the whole place sort of erupts at night. I've never known such a noisy country. I want you, it's incredibly noisy. And during the World Cup, it's going to be full volume. How would you describe Brazil culturally? It's very outgoing. They don't worry too much about what happened in the past. They're not speculating too much about the future. They do li live very much for the day. And most of the time, the sun shines. Not all the time, but the sun does shine. The beaches are great. You must wake up every morning and think, hey, I'm, I'm in a very blessed country. Um, but at the same time, there are cracks between that, between the very rich and the very poor. And that's very clear in the favelas. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how that all plays out when the eyes of the world are on the country. Football, it's, it's been involved in a lot of your work, hasn't it? Certainly in Python yeah. days and one or two other things. Yeah. Oh, Dad! I, I just think all of us in Python, with the possible exception of Terry Jones, is a bit sort of rugby, um, and Gilliam, who's those boomerangs and things but I mean <laughs> it was um, certainly Eric and John and myself were all brought up on football. Eight one. Eight bloody one. Do you think the way that Brazil play football, this flamboyant style, is a reflection of, of their personalities, of the people of Brazil? Yeah, I, I, I think they love life, you know, which is a terrible old cliche, but they really do. Yeah. And they want to celebrate it. So you don't just kick the ball, you do some wonderful sort of keep you up and wham and bam and, and pass it fast. And make a, you, you celebrate the game itself. It's not a doer game in Brazil. Football is very democratic, and so you don't need money to play football. We are third world here in Brazil, so all the kids all over Brazil, they can play football because they, they take some old socks and they make the ball and they start with the passion. Brazil's passion for football is obvious. They're just as devoted, though, to their music. Many love both. Accordion player, Zayu Azevedo. Brazilian music uh, is a mixture of uh, the Indian music, the African music brought to Brazil in the slavery time, and the European music. So Brazilian music is, is a, a pot of mixture of all these music and influences. There's more slaves went to Brazil than went to the North Americas. But whereas the slaves in North America weren't allowed drums, they were banned because it was kind of godless music. But the Brazilians kept that rhythm and they kept the samba and their songs are kind of, rather than America had the blues, <laughs> the, uh, Brazil was always celebrated life and freedom. Samba has the African influences of the beats. Uh, the rhythm is very energetic. Samba do mundo! I've been to Brazil about 20 times, uh, mainly for musical reasons. My favourite thing about Brazil is Brazilians. It's the, the soul of the, the Brazilians and the passion they have, and especially for music and football. We can move our body in a, in a way that it looks free, and so I think it, it comes to the, to the football in a very good way because you see them playing and it's, it's different. You know, when the footballers, you see the connections between them, it looks like they're dancing with the ball. The way they play football, it's kind of a dance. Uh, the romantic notion that they're all kind of whistling a samba to each other as they pass the ball, nah. Be more like the, the call and response of, uh, of the, like the samba schools where they go It's the way they play off each other. So I go, I'll go like that, and it's like, oh, and I'll take that and go like that. I can remember when we arriving um, in the bus for, for a match, we are dancing and singing in, inside the bus. In the national team, we've always had this tradition of singing, of being close together, especially on our way to the stadium. 
It's in the rhythm. Play your music like this and it's bound to influence the way you play your football. It's so very Brazilian. But what's more remarkable is that the roots of Brazil's beautiful game may just lie in Britain. Historian Andre Magali gives lectures around the world on the origins of football in Brazil. There are many versions of how football started in Brazil. The most accepted, of course, is that the British gentlemen came to Brazil early last century and they brought to Brazil many sports, among them the football. In a country so large as Brazil, it's difficult to say that just one person has a major role in bringing a great phenomenon uh, as football to the country. But I think uh, Charles Miller was important, actually, to have created the form of football uh, in Brazil. For many, football arrived in Brazil in 1894, when Charles Miller, having finished school in England, stepped off a steamer in Sao Paulo, armed with two footballs and a rule book. The son of a Scottish railway engineer, Charles had been sent to Southampton. He played for the club that would become the Premier League Southampton of today. He was a football nut. He used to say, imagine the despair of the football enthusiast who goes away for the weekend and take his ball along. Imagine his despair, knowing he was coming back to Brazil and that he wouldn't find here the beloved sport he used to play. So the fact that he brought along the rules of the game and the actual ball suggests very clear what his intentions were. I'll go back to Brazil and if no one is playing this sport there, I'll teach them all because I want to go on playing it for a long, long time. You know, in, in the early years in Brazil, one of, one of Brazil's most prominent writers, a guy called Graciano Ramos, he said, you know, this football, it will never catch on. We, we, don't, we don't need this foreign thing. And it, it's, it's a statement which seems, seems ridiculous now, but sometimes we take it for granted. How did this thing, little more than 120 years in Brazil, how did it become so associated with, with the Brazilian nation? It's introduced by the British. So it comes with first world prestige and it's first taken up by the Brazilian elite. But then it goes down the social scale. It becomes reinterpreted by the locals. I've got a few letters from my granddad written after his return to Brazil. He writes to England, to the school where he studied. He shows absolute surprise at the speed which football was spreading across Brazil. Unfortunately, he died in 1953 and died without ever seeing Brazil world champions. He also never had the pleasure of seeing Pelé play football. But if he was still alive, I imagine he would be very happy with all of this. Football is a cultural manifestation. Even though we didn't create football, it looks like we did. Brazil took football from the old world and turned it into a South American art form, artistry that delights but that also strikes fear into their opponents. Playing against Brazil, knowing all their history, it was a bit daunting. I managed to score against Brazil at Wembley, but another Englishman scored against them with a little more style and in the spiritual home of Brazilian football. To play against Brazil is always special. To play in the Maracana was even more special, knowing the history of the Maracana, the whole history of Brazilian football. And to score against Brazil is fantastic. John Barnes on the left side, comes inside Leandro. He could let one go here, he certainly could let one go. He keeps it on his right foot, he's gone all the way through. What a brilliant goal by John Barnes. That was quite magnificent. I would always say, had it been a World Cup final or, 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 or like a, a proper game, in a, in, you know, someone would have tackled me. Someone would have tackled me. I'm being a bit unkind to myself, but I suppose that, you know, rather than saying, oh, what a great goal it was, I'm saying that the Brazilians were probably on holiday or they were probably drunk. That's why they just let me run through. But when you talk about the beautiful game, you know, as much as lots of teams may now play like Brazil, you still think about Brazil. I remember driving through quite a lot of to go and do one of their games and the pavements 
were absolutely packed with Brazilian supporters. You got a sense then of what the World Cup meant to them. I think that's where the Brazilians really love playing. And that's where, of course, Gordon Banks made his fantastic save from Pelé. Met him a couple of times when he's come over to, to England. He says, I scored over a thousand goals in my career. He said, wherever I go in, in the world, he says, people talk about those goals. He said, but when I come to England, all they talk about is that save you made from my head. <laughs> it was something special because he, he was some, someone very special and they had a, a, a fantastic side. Other players have less pleasant memories of losing to Brazil at the 1982 World Cup. I can remember vividly, we lined up before the game. Ten metres from the fence where there's lots of Brazilians, the supporters and the girls doing all that. And I can remember, I was here, linesman, referee, linesman, Socrates and the rest of them. And I've looked at our guys and we're all, and we're covered in sweat. And I've looked there. <laughs> and I've looked at these guys. There's not a bead of sweat. And they're starting to sway their hips to the, the girls who are giving all the samba stuff behind this fence. I'm thinking, we're in Hell. trouble. We're in trouble here. In that, in that Brazil game, the worst thing we did was score early. Yeah. There he's coming through from right back. And there he The game was going perfect. Aye, nil, they were nil. happy. Yeah. Nil, nil, tick, tick, tick. And then we scored, and it was like getting hold of the lion's tail, wasn't it? And then we just found another gear and... That's some fabulous players, so then, I mean, Zico. That was Zico! Socrates, Falcao. Socrates is in there. Here's Falcao with the shot! And the rules are winging it. Hey there. Soonest again, Dalglish. But it was read fairly comfortably there by Oscar, who finds Adair. Adair, <laughs> who's, who chipped. <laughs> Got Adair in. Little chip. Oh, <laughs> what a brilliant goal! And they were there, great team. And it was an incredible team with Zico, Socrates, Falcao, Cerezo, Leandro, Junior, and was oh, was a Adair was a fantastic team. My idol was uh, and is still being Zico. Uh, you play a lot with the. Yeah, I yeah. played against him yeah, a few against. times. Yeah, great. Player. And I was seeing him a lot in Maracanã Stadium, and uh, he was amazing. I was grow up and see him in the field and out of the the field. He's for me is the biggest idol. We remember this team almost as fondly as the 1970 side because of their midfield brilliance. But Brazilians have a particular love for them because they played with freedom, while at home a military dictatorship was in firm control. They were um, people who understood the opposition in the society, Socrates, used to talk about the democracy, discussing about politics, um, fighting for the rights of the people, of even the, the supporters, discussing things that the football player never discussed before. So it was um, different personalities that mark a generation. Socrates is, is, is such a fascinating figure. Um, and he, he said in an interview after, after he'd, he'd retired, he said that those who only seek victory are just conformists. Socrates. Found the angle. Oh, Magnificent goal. But I'm sure in his heart of hearts, he would love to have won the 1982 World Cup. I would say that the 82 World Cup was brilliant. It was maybe the last World Cup we played as a brilliant team. A brilliant, brilliant team. Uh, but unfortunately, in 82, we lost. Sometimes, to win the World Cup, you have to play with caution. But this team only knew how to play beautifully and didn't care about anything else. Zico's Brazil were playing with the majesty of Pelé's World Cup winners. Undefeated, they only needed a draw against Italy, but it wasn't long before it began to go wrong. 1-0 to Italy, after only five minutes. And here's 
Socrates pushing the ball forward to Zika. Oh, what a turn. He threw Gentile. Socrates is in here. Socrates scores a goal that sums up the philosophy of Brazilian football. Serizo. Oh, Rossi. And Rossi did again. 2-1. A lot of people look at the fact that um, Italian pragmatism against the silky skills of the Brazilians and, and pragmatism won over. That's not necessarily true. They made a couple of mistakes. I don't necessarily believe that, you know, you had to sacrifice style for substance. Falcao over to the right in a good position. Still Falcao. What is right there? Falcao wipes out Italy's lead. And now if the score was to stay like this, Brazil go through and Italy go out. Bagomi is up there, shot by Tardelli, and it's been turned in! Paolo Rossi was there again! It's 3-2 to Italy! This almost retro, idealistic side of 1982 loses. Conclusion. If we want to win again, we have to change a little bit. Zico described it as the day football died. Here in Brazil, many shared the view that this was a defeat for the beautiful game. The team hadn't balanced defence with attack and now faced a choice to lose beautifully or win ugly. By 1994, Brazil were desperate for success and a young Leonardo, managed by Carlos Alberto Pereira, swapped flair for a more measured approach. I think that Pereira was very, very intelligent in that moment because it's true, you, you are Brazil, you have three World Cups winning, and, but you have 24 years behind you that um, you didn't get it. The coach, Carlos Alberto Pereira, said the time for magic and dreams in football is over. We have to be more pragmatic. The big discussion was to play with two midfielders in, uh, in front of the defence. In Brazil it seems like they have three midfielders and two are defending, oh, what is this, you know? But I think he knew that he had Romário and Bebeto to decide the matches. You know, I think that's Brazil sometimes. You know that they have some players who can decide the match at any moment. And that's how it was in a tricky semi-final against Sweden. They weren't always easy on the eye, but Pereira's pragmatists were through to the final against the masters of defence, their nemesis, Italy. Almost inevitably, it went to penalties. Yep, 0-0 for Italy is normal, but not for us. In the past, the penalty kicks was a nightmare for all of us. The man who really has brought the team to the final now has to save them. And it's over the top. Brazil have won the World Cup of 1994. To win a World Cup, I think, was a very, very important uh, title for us because, because after that we restart with Ronaldinho, with Roberto Carlos, with Ronaldo, with Rivaldo, you know. It was the opportunity for that players to grow up with, I don't know, the feeling that you are uh, again, number one, because my generation was a big weight for us. And for the fourth time, Brazil are the world champions of the beautiful game. It was an important victory for them after 24 years, although that team is still not remembered, certainly around the world, with quite the same affection as the team of 1982, which didn't win. What the Brazilian wants, it's a big spectacle and then the win, both together, perhaps only one. Perhaps they prefer more the spectacular than the winning. Brazil, without soccer, would not be Brazil. Soccer is like samba, it's very, it's very Brazilian, it's very part of us, you know. There is no, there is no weekend that I don't hear about football inside my house, you know. It's like a religion, it's very strong. 100% Brazil is about to host the World Cup. Brazilian TV host Fernanda Lima will help welcome the world. But there are strong emotions at work here, and not just a love of the game. In the very deep, I think we really want this World Cup. But we have a lot of social problems in the government that makes makes us feel the the, the World Cup 
is not to be here, but it is. People are using this event to show their problems, to show what they want. I don't think that we will interrupt the competition because during the 90 minutes, people will be there. They want to dream during it. But I think that outside of that, people want to, to be listened. People in Brazil are confused about the World Cup. Uh, people were thinking about the World Cup that uh, was uh, the solution for our problem. It's not the solution for our problem. The World Cup is a big opportunity to, to develop our country. If we think football belongs to us, we have to show the good football we have and the hospitality and the, the love we have for football. Brazil hosted the World Cup of 1950. Even back then it was huge. Just like today, Brazil was determined to make the most of its opportunity, tap into domestic pride, impress the outside world. The 50 World Cup was the opportunity to show the world that we're very big, that you were a big country who can really develop big things. That's why we construct Maracanã and say the biggest stage in the world. A giant spaceship parked just north of the city center, an extraordinary structure. And this symbolizes that Brazil is on the move. They had a wonderful team, played fantastic football, absolutely blew away the European journalists who went out to cover the World Cup. But they lost in the final, lost to Uruguay. They were coasting to win in the Maracanã Stadium, 199,654 <laughs> in the crowd. Yeah. Um, and Uruguay scored. Um, scored the, twice, 2-1, two yeah, they came from two, behind. 2-1, they came from behind. It has never left my mind. I was there doing my military service. Everyone was crying at the stadium. The country was in mourning. I was nine years old. I remember my father crying. and said, what happened? Brazil lost the World Cup, they said. <laughs> said it was a little confused because it was a big part before. No? Just everyone then thought they said, were going to win. Yeah, I said, then I, I remember. I said, no, don't worry, don't worry, papi. I'm going to win the World Cup for you. <laughs> yes. I knew some of the players and the coach from that team. And they were never, ever allowed to forget that they lost that game. It was a burden that they had to carry for decades and decades afterwards. And Barbosa being the goalkeeper, he had a hard, hard time living with that afterwards. In 1993, when Brazil need to beat Uruguay to qualify for the 1994 World Cup, he wasn't allowed to visit the Brazil players, in case he brought bad luck. Lose a final is ah, it's terrible because you were almost there. And what happened? Why? When Brazil lost the 1950 World Cup in the final, in the last minutes, it was not seen as just a sporting disaster. It was a failure of its people. The shock of defeat on home soil also meant a change of kit. Brazil's football authorities decided that the team's tarnished white shirts should be replaced by the colours of the country's flag. The green is the forest, the blue is the sky, and the yellow is the big king of the sun. So it's, I think, it's, how powerful is that? There is no doubt that when one puts on their country's shirt for the first time in an official competition, it's unforgettable. When you put your shirt from your national team, it's like you, you go to the war with, uh, with your country. You, you are a Marine. The other teams that are gonna, gonna play against Brazil, they're gonna look at it and, and feel the pressure. And I think everybody gets scared when they see <laughs> the Canarinho shirt. <laughs> I think they get really scared. Not so scared, the marketing executives of global brands, not frightened by a team or their shirts. By the late 90s, the team had returned to winning ways and signed a multi-million pound deal with Nike.
The main asset of Brazil's 1998 World Cup squad was Ronaldo. He'd taken himself off to Europe and was flourishing. I just won Ballon d'Or before the World Cup and uh, I was the biggest star for Brazil. Ronaldo was by now the biggest name in world football. As the tournament progressed, he was unstoppable. I think Ronaldo changed something in football because he starts to do in 100 km per hour what people before did in 50. He changed the speed of football. Ronaldo was and still and will always remain for me as one of the greatest strikers I've ever seen. Brazil, 13 goals in five matches. Now, a semi-final against the unbeaten Dutch. Here's Ronaldo! Ronaldo really was the successor to Pelé because Ronaldo, he had everything. The most complete player, Brazilian player since Pelé because he could score goals with his head, he could score goals tap-ins, he could score 30 yards, he could dribble around everyone. But the Dutch were no pushovers. It went to a penalty shootout. Up stepped Ronaldo. It's like always when you play for Brazil, you have to win, always. A lot of pressure, always with the Brazilian team. Greater pressure on the Dutch. Has to score. He doesn't. The world champions go to defend their title in the final. The tournament was going brilliantly for you, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it was until the final. <laughs> on paper, it was a dream final. Brazil the favourites against host nation France. Then, in the moments before kickoff, all eyes strained to see what was written on a single sheet of paper. We've just had the surprise news, I suppose the shock news, that Ronaldo will not be in the Brazil 11 for tonight's match. Just have a look at this at home if you can see it. Um, that's the actual 11 here, and you see that Edmundo is playing, and Ronaldo's on the list as a substitute. I'd got the team sheet in the studio. It didn't have him on it, and uh, Ronaldo on it, and we couldn't believe it, you see. So we got on to Motti and said, what's going on here? Desmond, I've never had anything like this in my career. The, the scenes in the commentary boxes for the last 45 minutes have been absolute mayhem and chaos. There were journalists and commentators racing around trying to find out the truth behind it. Yeah, it's a big news for the, the French team because Ronaldo uh, is very, very important for the Brazilian team. Uh, it was rumours about him being sick, being injured. Uh, so we thought it was a bit of... Um, to annoy the French team not knowing that the best player will play or not. I'm just going to interrupt you there because news has just come out that the biggest wind-up in World Cup football history has, has just hit the news because Ronaldo will play. There's been a big mistake in the team sheets. Suddenly there was a change. Another team sheet came and he was back on it. So there was a hiatus. It gave us a good story for a while. We were holding up team sheets in front of the camera and all that sort of stuff. Confusion reigned and conspiracy theories raged. Was this a mistake? A joke? Outrageous gamesmanship? What was really happening in the Brazilian team hotel? Only one person can say. I had a, a, a conversion before, after the lunch, at, uh, in the afternoon. And I was uh, inconscient for three, four minutes. So you were unconscious? Basically. Yeah, unconscious for three or four minutes. Do you know what? Do you know why you had this convulsion, this fit? No. no. And nobody knows. Do you think it was maybe the pressure and the nerves, or could be? Confident? Could be, but uh, you know, when when yeah, when you're there and you you breathe the 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 the, the competition, you. Everything is about the competition. You, you cannot disconnect from the competition. It's a lot of pressure. Doctors called me to another room and um, he explained to me that uh, I had a convulsion and, uh, and uh, that uh, we will not play. And I say, no, it's not possible. I, I want to play, I will play. And we went to the hospital. I, Stayed there for three hours. I did everything you can imagine of uh, medicine or 
test, everything. And no conclusion. I, I was all right. I was okay. It's, it's like uh, the convulsion. It's never happened. Crowds filled the streets of Paris. Ronaldo's teammates boarded the bus for the stadium, but the confidence that had carried them to the final was gone. When Brazil leaves the hotel for the match, it's all music. But on that day, this didn't happen. There was no music on the team bus. And everyone, all the players, were asking about him on the bus. If you are in silence in Brazil, you are fear. For the first time in the World Cup, Brazil have not come out to warm up on the pitch. We haven't seen a single player. I go out from the hospital, going to the stadium directly. And I came later, and there was Edmundo in, on my place. And what I said... What did you think when you said you saw the team sheet was up and there's, there's Edmundo and not Ronaldo? What, yeah. What did you say? Yeah, I understood, because I was in the hospital, but I, I called Zagallo and said, Zagallo, please, I have to play. I, I don't have nothing. I, I went to the hospital, everything's fine with me. I, it's the final game. I'm fine, I'm okay. I was waiting for the doctor, Lidio Toledo, to make a call, and he didn't say anything. As no one said anything, I took my role as a leader and said, are you okay? And he said, I'm not a kid. If it's another player, I don't know, you have 22 players. If the other is 21 players, there is no problem. You don't play, it's finished. If it's Ronaldo, it's what happened. It was very complicated to manage that situation. All the meets before organizing a match without Ronaldo, you prepare everything with Edmundo, even the corner kicks, the defend corner kicks and defend fouls and your organization, hard marks and everything. Then you change, sure, you, you have a problem, you know? And it was like that. And Zidane scored twice by corner kicks because our organization changed. Zidane with the header from the corner. I don't want to say that we lost because we had the problem, but it's impossible to say that it was a normal preparation for the match. Ronaldo. It was not the best game of my life, but I was fine. I was running, I was trying to do everything. France was playing very well, very hard team. One of the one, and it's there. Zidane again. Well, would you believe that? Is it like a disaster in Brazil when they yeah. go out of the World Cup, losing yeah. the final, yeah? Yeah. The same if uh, you lose on the, on the, the first round, uh, as the same uh, in the final. Really? Yeah, a disaster. Uh, if, if we got to a final, we'd be really happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the most yeah. of, uh, uh, of the rest of the world, yes, yeah. but not for us. Not for Brazil. Even before France lifted the trophy in Paris that night, Brazilians began to ask questions about their team's capitulation. Should Ronaldo ever have played? Could sponsors really have had any say in team selection? Nike got involved with the Brazil team a couple of years before the, the, the World Cup with the, the, the idea of selling shirts all, all over the world. And Brazil had no qualifiers for that World Cup. But Nike did their homework and they saw that many times Brazil played friendlies with severely weakened teams. Now, if they're paying big bucks for Brazil, they want Brazil. So it seems that there were clauses in the contract along the lines of, in these friendlies, um, a, a certain number of designated first choice players had to play. But obviously that has no relevance to a World Cup because you're going to select your best side in a World Cup anyway. But the fact that these clauses were secret opened up space for speculation. Nike denied having any influence over team selection and two years after the final, Aldo Ribello, then a congressman and now Brazil's sports minister, instigated a political inquiry. Was there any truth in the conspiracy theory? 
O mercado tem uma presença recente. Market forces are a new presence. Football never used to have sponsors. This is only from the 80s onwards, and it's brought risks. And this is what we're investigating at the committee. The inquiry found no evidence of wrongdoing. However, the fact that losing a football match led to a political inquiry shows just how seriously Brazil takes the beautiful game. There are so many stories around this episode with Ronaldo in 98 that us, the fans, don't really know what the real situation was, what actually happened. I wasn't surprised because Brazilians love football, they're very passionate about it, but when it doesn't work out, pressure is only natural, and that's just an element of Brazilian culture and people. Stress lines in the face of the beautiful game. Handling pressure is part of every professional footballer's life, but in Brazil, the current World Cup squad are well aware of what's at stake. It's not too much pressure. If you win the World Cup, you can stay there. If you not, you need to live in, in Europe or in another country. It's just, yeah, I think so. Italy played two times at home. Win one and lost one. Germany as well. Win one and lost one. Brazil just lost. So now is the moment to win. Winning the World Cup in 2002 offered Ronaldo redemption. Out of favour in club football, Ronaldo scored six goals on the way to the final. Every World Cup needs a hero, and Ronaldo is one here. Before the final, after lunchtime, did it go through your mind? Yeah. What happened four years previously? Yeah, of course. It did? Yeah. We had the lunch. After the lunch, everybody going to sleep and to doing your stuff. And I was looking for people there to talk to. You didn't want to, to go to sleep? With, yeah. In case it happened again? Yeah, I didn't want to go to sleep. And I found Dida, my teammate, the goalkeeper. And he was talking to me all the time until we left to the, to the stadium. Oh, wow. Oh, I was very, I was very scared. Lining up against Germany in Yokohama, would history repeat itself? Oh, it's come off guard, Ronaldo! It was fantastic, you know? After four years, come back to a World Cup final match, and then he scored two goals and became a World Cup champion again and the best player in the world. Tonight he makes headlines as a hero. After the finals, uh, we celebrate for three days. Yeah. Nobody's leaving. The burden of history discarded. In 2002, Ronaldo's reputation restored. Over a hundred years earlier, Brazil took British Association football and reshaped it. They fashioned it to reflect their physical power, their extravagance, their spirit of invention and their energy. It became the chosen game, the adored sport of a vast land of tropical vibrancy. Brazil, five times World Cup champions. Can the Brazil of 2014 build on the legacy or will they suffer under the strain, heat and pressure? Can the beautiful game still be played? We're about to find out. To one of football's most famous faces in the one place he won't be recognised, David Beckham heads into the unknown next. And Gary returns tomorrow night, joined by Rio Ferdinand and Alan Shearer for a World Cup preview at 10.35. And an American Dad double kicks off over on BBC Three in just over five minutes.